Let me clean here. I just needed to charge my um, my phone. All right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, who have joined us on this Dr. Fundi channel. Sincere apology for the delay. There were a few technical challenges that needed my attention. So um, today we have a very interesting conversation, the transatlantic conversation. We have experts from both sides of the Atlantic. We have got um, Professor Noza Jova, uh, who is a specialist dermatologist, uh, an expert on hair loss and hair uh, Somebody helped working with other specialists or scientists across the world to discover a gene that causes a major cause of um, permanent hair loss amongst women of African descent. Many know her as the dean of the medical school, the Nelson Mandela School of Medicine. She's also um, somebody who runs a part-time dermatology practice at Multimedics uh, in Umtlanga, north of Devon. She is a co-creator of a range of hair care products that we'll be talking about today called Nuele Pro, an innovative range of hair care products. The other guest from the other side of the Atlantic Ocean is Dr. Akiyama Osei. She is also a specialist dermatologist, um, a board certified specialist dermatologist by the FAAD in the US, also a specialist in hair loss, in hair restoration, uh, also has interest in aesthetic dermatology, dealing with things like laser hair removal, um, you know, uh, dealing with issues of hyperpigmentation, acne. Um, she's also, um, you know, somebody who is interested in the surgical skin care. She um, got her medicine, or, uh, MD, from Stony Brook University School of Medicine, did internship at the renowned uh, Mount Sinai Hospital, and uh, did her residency or training as a dermatologist at Sunny Health Sciences Center in Brooklyn, New York. She's very experienced in all aspects of dermatology, um, but also. Uh, like I said, she's an expert in hair loss and hair restoration. Very passionate about hair loss education. Um, she does a lot of talks in hair shows, symposia, uh, and also with stylists in and around New York. Her interest on matters um, uh, of ethnic skin. Um, you know, so there's a commonality between her and uh, Dr. Lova. And then uh, our other guest is Mr. Mana Wolfenbusen, uh, who is the director and the MD of Saradox, a uh, good staff company, and also a teaser genics group of companies. Uh, he's a serial entrepreneur, qualified as a mechanical engineer uh, from the University of Pretoria. Uh, he's got a lot of experience uh, over 20 years in the personal care and FMCG products, that is fast moving consumer goods products, uh, in the manufacturing of those. Um, and uh, she, you know, sorry, he has worked at Unilever at all levels, starting as an engineer, all the way to being a director. He now runs, you know, uh, his own companies. He's a business strategist, extensive knowledge in supply chain, manufacturing, engineering. And like I said, FMCG management experiences. Um, so yeah, uh, he is um, the person who will tell us a lot about the processes that were involved in the manufacturing of these Nuele, um, you know, uh, Nuele Pro Pro. So, um, Rob Glover, 
Dr. Seydou, Mana, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Nyati. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, man. So we are going to have a relatively you know, chilled kind of conversation. Um, but uh, this show is meant to be an informative show. Uh, we've got lots of people who have joined us on Zoom uh, on this webinar. Um, you know, but there are also those uh, who are following us via YouTube, via Facebook, via Instagram, and also via Twitter. So during the course of uh, this conversation, we will take some questions from all of them, um, you know, and we'll deal with those that we can deal with. Um, so um, I will start with Professor Dover. Professor Dover, we are going to be talking about hair, you know, um, the problems relating to hair and how those problems uh, can be solved. Um, you know, the deeper understanding of the science, the physiology, the chemistry of hair. Uh, and so um, my first question to you, Snow, uh, I, I call you Snow or Dr. Dover, um, is basically just to say um, to this audience, I mean non-medical people. When we talk of hair, I understand there's different types of hair out there. Can you just give us a little bit of understanding, you know, when we talk of hair and the different types, what are we talking about? Then my next question will go to Dr. Osei Tutu, uh, and that will be about you know, um, we understand that there are growth cycles when, you know, uh, about hair. A little bit at a simplistic level, you know. Um, what happens in the growth of hair? You know, at what point do people lose hair? Is it part of a normal process for people to lose hair? That's the basic way before we go uh, and take the questions from the people. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Fundil, and thanks, Dr. Nyati. Uh, and uh, we are grateful for you to invite us on your platform so we can share some of our expertise and experience in this field, something that we are very passionate about. So if we talk about hair, hair is a living structure. It's a protein. And uh, if we look at the different types of hair and we look at the different ethnicities, you know, we've got African, African-Americans, Afrocentric, we have Caucasians, and we have Asians. So the structure of the hair itself, uh, the actual chemical composition of the hair is the same, you know, in terms of the amino acids, the building block that is, it contains. It's similar, it's similar in all ethnic groups. But what is different is the actual structure because African hair tends to be uh, coiled. It tends to form knots and it also tends to be uh, uh, dry due to the decreased amount of sebum that may be produced, as well as the fact that it's not straight, therefore it's not easy for the oils to come from the scalp to, to, to follow up this hair strand. But if you look at Caucasian and Asian hair, the hair, they tend to have longer hair. The hair, it doesn't have many knots and therefore it's not prone to breakage and it's not as fragile as African hair. And it tends to grow very long compared to African hair. African hair can only reach a certain length, but of course, with the mixing and genetic mixing, you'll find that some hair is much curly, is coiled. So if one looks at the classification that uh, L'Oreal Research came up with, there's about eight different physical types of hair, from type one, which is straight hair, to type eight, which is very coiled, kinky hair. And that is the most fragile of all, because you find that if you stretch the hair, you can actually pull the hair, but it shrinks, you know, once you put water or when, when it's not moisturized. So those are the different types uh, of hair that we have. And the main uh, take home message, you know, in, in a simplified manner, when we're talking about hair and the different ethnicities is that African hair in a nutshell tends to be coiled, kinky with a lot of knots, which makes it very prone to breakage. The second thing about African hair is that it tends to be dry. And therefore that's the reason why we need to moisturize it. We need to condition it and we need to make sure we shampoo it. Then the other unique thing about Caucasian hair is that the Caucasian hair and Asian hair, what I would call Eurasian hair, tends to be straight. It's not uh, kinky, doesn't have coils, and it's not prone to breaking. 
And of course, because of the structure of the hair itself, it is, it's easy for the oil that comes from the sebaceous glands, which are the oil glands on the scalp, to run through the, the whole strand of the hair. And therefore, they tend, that type of hair tends not to need a lot of moisturizers and oil. So I will leave it there because those are the main really take home messages in terms of in a simplistic way. I don't want to be too technical. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much <laughs> to Dr. Osei Tutu. Um, just, uh, you know, reading uh, your bio before you came here, um, you know, I picked up that you've got this special interest on ethnic hair and ethnic skin. Um, so yeah, uh, can you just, anyway, the question that I posed earlier, the growth cycles of hair. You know, yeah. I understand that there are cycles of growth in, in hair, I think three different uh, stages or something like that. Just for a simple person uh, who's not a dermatologist, just tell us a little bit about that and what is the significance of knowing that anyway? Sure, so you, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Well, thank you for having me first and foremost. Um, it's great to be up here with all of you and see all of you. So we have three main cycles of hair growth, um, of hair. Um, or sorry, the hair cycles in three main um, ways. So we have anagen, telogen, and catagen. So anagen is the hair growth cycle, and it usually lasts anywhere from two to seven years. So um, somebody's hair who can grow rather long, maybe they have a longer anagen cycle, and that really is genetically pre predetermined. There's actually a medical condition, so you ask why we need to know these things, called short anagen syndrome where um, patients with this condition cannot grow very long hair. Yes. And if you take the antigen phase from the scalp to the eyebrows to the eyelashes, you know, you're talking about years for the hair versus months to weeks for areas where the hair tends to grow um, quite short, right? Um, yeah. And interestingly, I do hair transplantation. Oftentimes when we do eyebrow transplantation, when we take hair from the back of the head and we transplant it on the eyebrows, the hair on the eyebrows tends to grow very long. So you constantly have to be cutting them, right? Because it's coming from an area that is genetically predetermined to grow a lot longer. Yeah. Right? Okay. Right. Yeah. So antigen, um, so that's antigen. Um, catagen is sort of a transition phase. There are other cycles, but these are the three main. Um, and then you have um, telogen and about 10 to 15% of the hairs are in telogen, about 85 to 90% of the hairs are in antigen. And they're, every single hair follicle is kind of doing its own thing, going along very systematically. And telogen is the cycle where the hair sheds and it has to do that in order for a new hair to emerge. Um, and that cycle lasts um, um, you know, several months. And telogen is important because there is a hair loss condition that is frequently observed in our clinics called telogen effluvium. And in this condition, the hair sheds and it sheds more than the normal. So what happens is that you may have some sort of a systemic insult, maybe it be post-pregnancy. We see a lot of women and you know, a lot of pregnant um, women can tell us after they deliver, their hair will shed significantly like three to six months after they deliver. You might have, might have it post-surgically, after you take a particular uh, medication, after you have um, undergone some sort of a, a medical issue like a thyroid problem, um, the hair will shed maybe three to six months after that. And that shedding can last another three months to a year. Um, and the reason why we tend to notice it is because you have a greater proportion of those hairs that are supposed to be and the growth phase that go into the, the, um, the telogen phase, the antigen from telogen. So you tend to notice it more. So that's telogen. And th that's basically the, the three main um, cycles. Beautiful. So both you, uh, Dr. Tutu and Dr. Lova, Prof. Lova, um, you have this interest in coming up with solutions uh, to problems of ethnic hair. You have collaborated, uh, you know, to come up with a new uh, range of hair products called Nuele Pro. Now, I want to know, um, how did you guys meet uh, to know that you've got the same interest to develop hair that addresses a particular group of people? And then after that, I'm going to ask Mana, you know, how did Mana meet with you guys so that you are now a team 
that has come up with a very brilliant, you know, um, a, a, a range of, of hair products. So let me just start with, uh, you know, uh, you, Dr. Seitutu, so that you can add on the how you guys met, because you are separated by the Atlantic Ocean. Yes, you are in the same field, but somehow you guys managed uh, to find each other and... Uh, both of you, by the way, I understand, Dr. Zaytutu, you, your parents originally come from Ghana. So um, in a way, you are now, you know, planting back in your, your um, I'll call it a home continent, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I was also born in Ghana. I am oh. Ghanaian. Yes, I came to the United States when I was two. Um, so I still have very strong ties there. So um, we have a mutual colleague and friend, um, Dr. Anthony Rossi, who's still our, our friend and colleague today. Um, I, I do hair transplantation and my focus is on women of African descent. And um, Dr. Glova wanted to learn how to do hair transplants. And um, I believe Anthony came over to South Africa to do a, a sort of a training and to teach some of her students how to do dermatologic surgery. And he mentioned me, um, and she came over, you know, contacted me and I said, of course, come over. She came over with her husband and her son. And I think the first minute that we met each other, there was an immediate like sisterhood. Uh, um, you know, I always say like we fell in love with each other. It was love at first sight. Um, <laughs> and uh, we spent the whole weekend uh, week together, you know, bonding and talking about our mutual interests. Um, talking about, you know, some of the dirt and the products that we see on the market um, on the continent and specifically in South Africa, because the market is a little bit more robust. Um, you know, I have wanted to come up with a hair range for a long time. Um, she wanted to come up with a hair range for a long time. Um, and so we decided to really just join forces and talk about some of the things that we thought were really important to us. Um, in the United States, we are quite blessed that we have a lot of products targeted towards women of African descent, which is a, 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 a big blessing. Um, I, I don't believe until recently there was a dermatologist specific, you know, hair product range for curly coily hair um, until recently. Um, however, in, in on the continent, there was really nothing going on. And so we wanted to come up with a product line that was made on the continent by two essentially, you know, I consider myself a continental African dermatologist. <laughs> Um, uh, specifically for the, uh, to meet the needs of curly coily hair. And then also, um, with ingredients that are, um, you know, safe, effective, um, and would help people with the things that we know tend to plague our patients in clinic who are already dealing with underlying scalp issues. Beautiful. Beautiful. Do you want to add something there, uh, Professor Rover? Before we go to Mana? Yeah, of course. I mean, as uh, Achiyama <laughs> mentioned, it was like love at first sight. <laughs> you know, when we were passionate about something, uh, we, I think we slept at 2 a.m. that day. That's that right. Day, right? <laughs> and uh, you can see, I mean, Achiyama is such a lovely, warm, barber personality. So it was really amazing. And I had not, you know, it was the first time I met her, but immediately, you know, we just dealt. And uh, so yeah, the rest is history. We've started this project about like five years ago now. Right. And mm -hmm. as Achiyama says, it's the first product made by dermatologists, a hair product made by dermatologists in the continent. We saw the gap and we saw the need from personal experience as well as from the patients who complain about certain issues. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, let's welcome Emana. Uh, you know, I've kept him, you know, uh, waiting there. Uh, Mana, please unmute yourself. Um, I'm interested, um, one, on the how you guys met with uh, Professor Rova. But even before then, I, I, I need to know a little bit about, you know, um, Sarah Docs, you know, the good work that you guys are doing, you know, the high standards of the products that you come up with and what you have put, you know, behind in terms of the, you know, quality uh, management of this product, uh, this Nuella Pro uh, range of product uh, that uh, is being manufactured in your premises. Doctor, thank you very much. Um, and, and thanks for inviting me to this group. 
maybe maybe a bit of context. <clears throat> um, we find many small businesses or specialist people come up with an immense amount of great ideas uh, for their customers, for their consumers. And one of the biggest challenges that they face is finding somebody to actually make it for them. Um, and, and, and that's always been a problem because you wouldn't, when you want to start a small business, uh, you can't go to a big manufacturer and say, can we please have 500 or 1,000 or 2,000 of these units? They will actually start laughing at you because mm -hmm. within the fast-moving consumer goods, uh, there are certain minimum quantities that, that they require for you to make. And there are very few companies that actually fill this gap. Um, so how do we find ourselves in this situation at the moment? Uh, as you said, when we opened, when you opened, um, my speciality has always been in the area of fast moving consumer goods and manufacturing supply chain, setting up channels for people to actually manage and distribute their products. So we started a company about eight years ago uh, where we manufacture uh, a brand we call the company Saradox. It's a specialist uh, personal care manufacturing facility. Um, and we've got a major brand that we manufacture called Good Stuff, which is sold in retail here in, in South Africa. Uh, but at the same time, we open our doors to smaller businesses where we try and help them launch their new products into the market. Um, and, and that is where, where we really came in. Uh, one of the scientists that were involved or one of my suppliers that were involved in assisting with the formulation of the product, he contacted me one day and he said, am I able to help uh, Prof here? Um, they've got a product that they want to bring to the market. Are we able to assist them? Um, and I said, by all means, please send me uh, the proposed formulas. We can see what we can do. We can fine tune the formulas. And, and that's where the relationship started. Um, we, we ended up getting this masses of information. Uh, I worked through it. I started contacting um, uh, Prof and we started chatting as to how we're going to make it work. Um, so our, our facility is, is ISO 9001 2015 accredited. Um, so that immediately fits the profile for, for the requirement. Also in terms of the quality standards that are required with this kind of product. Um, mm -hmm. We spent, uh, we, we spent, I think it was like three to six months and the normal procedure, we, we, we made small batches of the product. We submitted it for samples, testing. Um, even though I don't have African hair uh, <laughs> and, I, and it doesn't really suit me, I, I gave some of it to my wife to try and she was ecstatic about it. Uh, and we ended up um, approving the batches. Um, what our speciality also is on the supply chain side, I said to Prof, look, uh, we can also help you set up a channel for selling. Um, and I have a team that helped to build a website. We set up an online web platform for where she could sell a product. And so now we comply, we supply a complete supply chain service. We manufacture the product for her. We store it in a warehouse. And as her orders start coming in from her customers online, we ship it from, from straight from here direct to her customers. So she hardly touches the product. Only once in a while she phones us and said, please, can you send me some stock to my practice? My customer wants some stock and yeah. the supplier with the stock to, the, to her practice. So, um, and, and that's the service that we provide. Um, and, and that is the nice part of, of what we do in trying to help and support small businesses in South Africa. And we've got a number of these smaller customers that we actually try and help them get their businesses off the ground. Yes, because um, again, I saw that there is a small business that you are helping a lady who's in the detergent space, you know, um, and uh, I think Bonambi is the name, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. Bonambi Shangase, yes. Shangase, sorry, yeah, Shangase, yes. yes. All right, so, um, right, let me go back to the doctors. I'll come back to you, Mana. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, before I ask this next question from the, you know, the dermatologist, I just want to say to anyone who has joined us on Zoom um, or on the other channels, YouTube, uh, Facebook, please send through your questions. Because the intention of this show uh, is to ensure that it's much more interactive 
it's talking to some of the questions that uh, you know you've been having um, about hair, whether you have a problem of loss of hair or you want something that will help you restore hair or there's other problems relating to hair, other diseases. You know, you've got two dermatologists. It's going to be a free consultation, <laughs> you know, uh, just for you get some advice. Obviously, it does not replace your own doctor or your own dermatologist, but uh, who, you know, uh, you've got two people who are very passionate about issues relating to hair. So I want you to send through questions uh, on this call. Um, you know, please uh, use the Q&A function uh, to send through the questions. And uh, if you're on YouTube or on Facebook, you can uh, leave some comments there, uh, questions there, so that I can be able to pose those uh, to, 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 to the doctors. Now, um, Prof. Nova, in your South African experience, um, what have you found as the common issues that affect hair? You know, just top three, top five issues that people usually come for uh, in relation to their hair. And I'm going to ask the same question from you, Dr. Say too. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, uh, Dr. Nyat. Before I address your question, I just wanted to thank uh, Mana for you know, working uh, uh, with us. He's really been a godsend. My, I, I always say to him, you know, he's like uh, uh, my uncle from another father that I didn't know about because the way he embraced us, the way he was so supportive. Uh, so really, if we could so have so many people with such a, a golden heart, uh, it's really amazing. So Mana, thank you once more for everything that you did for us, for embracing us, not even knowing us from a bar of soap. And of course, I want to thank Wayne who could not join us, who was the biochemist who assisted with the formulation because he introduced me to Mana. So now there's no looking back. And thank you, Mana, for that. It's a pleasure. Yes. So Fundile, to ask, uh, answer your questions, well, the most common cause uh, of hair loss that we see in South Africa is traction alopecia, which is unfortunately a self-induced kind of hair loss. And this is what we call in Jibaba, uh, in uh, Zulu or Iskosa, where people yeah. put their hair on the hairline. And this is purely due to poor uh, grooming techniques, where there's pulling of the hair using inappropriate uh, hair, links, uh, hair, 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 uh, hair grooming techniques. And that's the most common one. And most of the time, this is due to, as I mentioned, pulling off the hair, very tight hair, and some of the symptoms of that are if you can get pimples on the hairline, as well as redness and the tight, uh, uh, um, tight hairstyles usually cause this. Of course, tight ponytails can also cause this problem. So it's important that people try. And I know each time I ask my patients, please don't pull your hair. There's someone with a hairstylist, they pull the hair, they don't listen. So as a result, I've actually partnered, we did a study last year where we invited, not last year, two years ago, we invited about 200 or so hairstylists and we gave them a lecture on how to look after the hair. We've actually uh, are in the process of publishing that study. And our study showed that uh, before the lecture that we gave, people knew nothing uh, in terms of the causes of hair loss and how the poor handling of uh, African hair causes problems. As I mentioned, and Prof. Uh, Dr. Say, too, to mention that the fragile hair, the dry hair, the knots are a problem. So African hair needs to be handled with care. So that's the most common problem. Another issue that is really disturbing now, uh, again, uh, causing or, or worsening the hair loss is the use of uh, uh, extensions and braiding, uh, those tight hairstyles that have, and the each challenge here, yeah, seeing three-year-old children with, traction alopecia at such an early age because of the, the extensions that their mothers put on their hair and the weaves, et cetera. So that's the first problem related to traction, which is something that is preventable and something that we're really working hard to educate the consumers, the public, as well as the hairstylists about. We've also partnered with Dark and Lovely to try and uh, embrace this and teach the consumers about the, the problem of traction alopecia, which can actually become irreversible. The second problem that we're seeing 
is a co condition called uh, frontal fibrosing alopecia. PT, I could share some slides here. Maybe I will later on uh, and because it's a Zoom platform. This is a condition where women mainly lose hair from the hair. And when it starts, it can be easily mistaken with the traction alopecia. And it's very important that patients or consumers see their dermatologists as early as possible, particularly dermatologists who are familiar uh, with hair loss. The third condition is central centrifugal secatricial alopecia, CCCA. This is the condition that we have done some research on, and that's the third most common condition uh, that we see. Well, I'm, I'm merely talking about conditions that cause irreversible hair loss, not so much those that can be reversible. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Snow. And maybe just to complete the issue about hair loss, um, in 2019, you were part of a group of people who discovered a gene that uh, is responsible for a certain type of hair loss that is found in women of African descent. Can you just complete with that one before I go to Dr. You know, uh, uh, Ose Tutu? Sure, oh, thanks, uh, Dr. Nyat. Yeah, uh, it was an exciting uh, finding. We collaborated with colleagues from the US, uh, uh, Mike Michael, as well as uh, Pro, uh, Professor Amy from uh, Israel and colleagues. And we discovered we had about 30 families uh, where we found uh, the gene, the PAD3 gene, which was common amongst all these families and uh, well, not amongst all of them, a certain percentage of them. And what we found also was that uh, patients who were grooming their hair frequently, for example, relaxing the hair, frequent tight uh, hair grooming hairstyles, and a combination of those tend to have a severe presentation of this condition. So our take home message there was that if you have a family member who loses hair, this is more especially here on the crown. People tend to lose the hair on the crown. And uh, um, so it, it can be irreversible and it is actually linked to a specific gene. But of course, we feel that there's a genetic predisposition with environmental factors which, which can actually aggravate the condition, make it worse and difficult to abort. But of course, with all these conditions, if you present to your doctor early, uh, we may be able to abort the condition in terms of by using a certain forms of medical treatment. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. All right, uh, Dr. Osei Tutu, um, I introduce you as a restoration as, as, as an expert uh, on hair restoration, you also told us that uh, you're big on, you know, doing hair transplants. So that already gave me ideas because, as you can see, uh, I'm bald-headed, I'm hiding something. <laughs> me and Mana, we come from the same WhatsApp group. <laughs> so yeah. Um, so yeah, common challenges that you have to do with hair. But I want you to touch also on the issue of male pattern boldness. You know, uh, the kind of challenge that I have that makes me to cut my hair short on a weekly basis. And you know, how successful are the transplants? that uh, you guys do uh, to try and assist uh, people like me. Okay, so um, I'll talk about men and women. So I wanna echo some of the things that um, Professor talked about. Um, in women, we do see a lot of traction alopecia in my office and she explained beautifully what that is typically caused by. Um, I also, a lot of people also com come in complaining about very dry, itchy, scaly scalps. Um, and there are a number of things that can tend to cause that. Anything from seborrheic dermatitis, which is um, a little bit of a yeast overgrowth on the scalp. Um, sometimes that happens and gets worsened by the fact that, you know, many women wait a very long time to wash their hair. You know, sometimes they wash it every two weeks or once a month. Um, and that can lead to a continued proliferation of that yeast on the scalp. Um, I, I do also tend to see that central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia that um, Professor and, and her group um, discovered the gene for, um, frontal fibrosing alopecia, as she mentioned. And then also lastly, um, just plain female pattern hair loss, mm -hmm. which is uh, due to a hormonal imbalance on the base of the sensitivity of the hair follicles. And that's probably the most common cause of hair loss across all races. Um, mm. With respect to men, of course, we see a lot of male pattern alopecia. 
which is due to, um, you know, elevated levels of dihydrotestosterone on the scalp, um, yep. you know, usually happening on the more frontal part of the scalp. Um, men, we also see, and I think people may tend to miss it, a lot of these inflammatory alopecias that, that um, Dr. Dulova talked about, central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia, I diagnose in men all the time. I have a very interesting case of a gentleman who had two hair transplants, did a procedure called platelet-rich plasma. The hair loss was getting worse, um, showed up in my clinic, um, noticed that the hair scalp just didn't look good. We biopsied him. He actually ended up having the condition CCCA. We gave him medications and all of the hairs that he was losing grew back. So it's very important to get in the hands of a dermatologist who will start to think about other things besides things that are the most common. Um, and so hair transplants have been out for a very long time, started with the Japanese. Um, then, you know, the Americans got a hold of it and has really been through several um, evolutions over um, the years. And now we do these micrographs where we take things in follicular units. So if you look at any um, hair follicle, it comes in groupings of one, two, three, four, or even five. And yeah. we move the hairs in those units. Um, and so it can look extremely natural. You can use it in across all um, racial and ethnic groups. Um, and they're very successful. I do them in men and I do them in women. I do them in, in, in women, particularly with scar and alopecias under very strict and certain circumstances. I think the things that we have to worry about most when we're dealing with women is how they're going to style their hair after they do the transplant. If they're coming out of attraction alopecia due to hairstyling, you know, um, it can be very challenging. And I find that even to be more challenging than the surgery sometimes, trying to figure out what they're gonna do with their hair after they do the surgery, so. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. All right, there are some questions that have come through from the audience and maybe let me, uh, you know, pose those questions. Um, there's one uh, that came through. Um, it's, it's, it's from Nandile Kwabe. Thank you very much for this session. I just wanted to ask, which chemicals or ingredients should we be cognizant of when procuring hair products? Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, anybody can take that question from the docs? Yeah, so I'll, I'll start. Um... So one of the things that we mentioned uh, previously is the fact that um, curly, coily African descendant hair tends to be quite dry and dryness leads to brittleness and brittleness needs to breakage, right? And one of our issues is um, hair retention if we're looking um, for the hair to grow. And so the, the important thing that we wanna keep in mind is to make sure that we don't do anything throughout the process of grooming, grooming our hair to make sure that we keep the moisture in our hair. And um, one of the ingredients that may tend to dry the hair when you're looking for shampoos, we tend to break them up into, into different groups. And um, one of the groups um, has something called sodium lauryl sulfate in it. And sodium lauryl sulfate, although um, a great ingredient because it does, does tend to um, really cleanse the hair very well. And in some instances, when you have a lot of buildup on the hair, you know, maybe once a month, every, you know, once every two months, depending on your hair's needs, you might need it. If you use it on a continuous basis, it will tend to dry the hair out a lot, particularly if you don't follow it up with um, good um, moisturizing ingredients. So I would say um, to um, be careful of, not avoid completely, but be careful of, you know, consistent use of sodium lauryl sulfate um, products in your shampoos. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Dr. Robert, do you have an answer? Uh, that, or do you want to add there on what uh, Dr. Seitutu has already mentioned? You know, when it comes to, um, you know, skin lightening creams, for example, you know, there used to be a problem years ago of some chemical, I think it was called hydroquinone or something like that, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, it was banned here in South Africa, although some people still find a way of hiding and putting it, you know, in their products. So I think um, the, the question was also, if there's something like that, that, you know, is really a no-no, but uh, some unscrupulous, you know, uh, people actually find it, you know, as something to put in in the, some of these hair products. Well, um, you know, there was a, a study several years ago um, at, uh, at Harvard, um, and it was the Harvard Environmental Group, and they looked at products targeted um, towards 
people of African descent. And they, they did a chemical analysis of some of the products and about 80% of the products that they found to be quote unquote harmful um, were not actually even listed on the box. Right. Um, and some of these ingredients included, um, you know, parabens and things that might be what we call endocrine disruptors and endocrine disruptors, whether they be, you know, medicinal or non medicinal are, are chemicals that interrupt the processing of various hor hormones within the body. Um, and that can, in some instances, lead to issues of fibroids, which are very common, you know, in women of African descent um, and in some instances, issues with fertility. Um, and they're still working on, on that, same, um, that same issue. Um, and a lot of the um, essential oils that sometimes we use can also potentially cause a problem if used on a regular basis. Things like lavender, um, ylang lang, and things like that. So, you know, everything has to be used in, in moderation. Yeah. 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 If I can just comment on, on also on, on what, what Dr. said about um, sodium lauryl sulfate, the, spe yeah. the specifics of factors that we use in, in, in the hair products at the moment is actually sulfate free. Mm -hmm. So it is actually a very gentle blend of surfactants that's mm -hmm. specifically used, designed for, for this kind. So it doesn't necessarily dry out the hair um, and it's a completely natural surfactant. So it's not... It's not a synthetic surfactant. It's very mild, um, and hence it assists in in washing the hair and preventing dryness and brittleness in the hair. And there's a number of other ingredients in these formulations that assist in in moisturising the hair more on a natural basis. So there's quite a significant amount of natural oils and ingredients in there. So when when people look at buying uh, specific products, try and find uh, uh, sulfate free products and products that contain a high, high concentration of moisturizing oils for specific for the hair. Beautiful. Thank wow. you. Yeah. If, I Thank can, you. if I can, if I can, if I can jump in there also, uh, Dr. Nyat, yes, I fully uh, concur and endorse uh, Dr. Ose Tutu and Mana's uh, prominence, very important. And as the uh, as uh, Dr. Chiyama also to, to mentioned the, uh, um, uh, the sulfates, you know, if uh, I think one of the attendees asked what to look for, it's things like cocobutane and thiazolones. Those are the uh, uh, sulfates. And then uh, aminophenol is something that is, uh, has, has been described as Achiyama mentioned as an endocrine disruptor. And another important thing is to look at the pH of the products because the closer the pH is to your body pH, which is about 5.5, the less drying and less damaging it is to the hair uh, fiber itself and the scalp, because most products actually don't display uh, the pH. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and 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 these uh, Nuele products, Nuele Pro products, uh, their pH is five point five, which is very close to the five that you're talking about. Yes. Okay, we'll talk more about the products. Um, okay, there's another question um, that has come true. Uh, the question is from Patience Lukomo. What are some of the reasons for hair loss in older African women, say from age 50? My mother is almost old, save for the middle and the rear part of the head. Any of the two can yeah. take... So, so I think it's a lot of what we had mentioned previously, um, you know, in the most common form of hair loss, particularly as we get older, is female pattern alopecia. And that's really due to a sensitivity issue of the normal circulating levels of androgens or male hormones um, within the scalp. Um, also, um, women tend to get that central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia as well. And you may combine that with a lifetime of hairstyles and people may have multiple types of hair loss conditions on the same head. I see that quite a bit. Um, anybody who has significant hair loss usually has androgenic alopecia, female pattern hair loss, CCCA, and then some traction over time. And then unfortunately, when you get to them, you know, it's, it's a little bit too late. So I'll let um, Dr. Tulova add to that. All right. I fully agree uh, with Dr. Achiyama. CCCA, like in Brano Pilaris, and of course, uh, female pattern hair loss, which is called imbanza, because women can also get imbanza, but uh, it's not so common amongst uh, African women as compared to uh, African Americans, because they usually mix genetic background. 
So women of African descent tend not to have so much of imbandla or female partner loss, but sometimes it can be a mixture of the different conditions. If you allow me to share, Dr. Nyati, uh, yep. I can maybe share some, because uh, it's just to give some context to, to, to the, um, to, but you can carry on when, when I'm yeah. ready. Right, right. Let, let me do something. I just hold on, uh, Prof. Lover. Let me make you a co-host so that you can be able to share. Right. So there is a question here from another fellow dermatologist, um, you know, Dr. Unolo Mushiana. Brilliant initiative, Prof. and partners. You continue to inspire us. Is the product or are the products, the Nuele Pro products that we are going to talk about, only meant for alopecia or they are for general health care? What are the main ingredients in the product? So I think uh, we're going to get to that, but maybe address what you wanted to address uh, before you answer your fellow dermatologist. Sure. Uh, so let me share my screen. And uh, let's see. Uh, right. Uh, yeah. Maybe let's carry on with the. With the Oh, with the questions, okay. Yeah. There's another question um, that has come through from my colleague here at work, Tamagwini, uh, Tologa Zehafi. Interesting topic, Doc. Now I would like to know the relation between hair loss and birth control measures. Can that be prevented? Could it be a side effect of the other drug to deal with this? You know, so I think the, the concern is around whether there is a connection between birth control, you know, options. Uh, I'm sure here we're talking uh, about oral contraceptives uh, or injectable and hair loss. Dr. Tutu, uh, say Tutu. Yeah, so um, anytime you start um, altering um, hormones or any other chemicals within the, the body, it can shift the hair growth cycle, right? And so, um, you can have a, a shedding phase when you initiate and you stop um, any type of birth control. Um, some birth controls, which tend to be progesterone heavy, um, can um, present with female pattern hair loss or androgenetic alopecia. So there definitely is an association and we have to be careful. So either shedding or um, female pattern hair loss, we tend to see with, with birth control. But most of these things don't need, need to necessarily a permanent type of scarring balding. Um, telogen effluvium, once you stop the insult, it can tend to um, sort of come back, so. Okay, all right. Um, are you ready, Prof. Lover? No, they stopped the, st the screen sharing. I think your panel, but please try and ask me to, allow me to share, but can you read the questions? Um, no, no, you, 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 you still have no, to be a co host. Okay. Uh, okay. Let me yeah, keep trying. Quickly. Yeah, let, I'll keep trying. Okay. All right. There is a comment here from Namsa Sislali. Thanks for this feature, Doc. So happy to hear that we have African women meeting this need in the market. I've had alopecia areata for several years, seven to be exact. I was advised that it was a result of inflammation in the body and is irreversible. I was also suffering from thyroid issues at the time. The thyroid issues have since resolved. I'm very interested in the transplant option since the underlying cause of the inflammation has now been resolved. Where can I get consultation? Um, so I don't know if Prof is still working. So alopecia... Yeah, no, that's okay. Yeah, yeah. go ahead, Achiama. I'll, I'll, I'll tell after you that we will be starting hair transplant. Uh, yes, uh, I was going to tell them. Yes, yeah. yes. So no, go ahead. It's an autoimmune condition where the body starts to attack the hair follicle um, and creates inflammation. Um, it doesn't destroy the hair follicle. Okay, perfect. Now we get to see. Um, it doesn't destroy the hair follicle. I'll let Dr. Dulova, um Finish. Maybe she can answer part of the question in her presentation. Okay, sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can you see my screen? 
Yes, yeah. we can. Yeah, so I just thought these pictures will put into perspective what uh, Dr. Chiama and I have been talking about on your platform. This is a lady who is in her middle age, uh, who's got a condition called CCCA, Central Centrifugal Secretarial Alopecia. It's involving the crown. The one on the left uh, has got a milder early version of it. The one on the right is quite extensive. But again, the earlier we see this, the earlier the hairstylist pick this up, the better. And this can occur run in families as well. So if your mom or aunt has got this condition, you should try and see a dermatologist as soon as possible to try and avoid this progressing. This is quite an extensive form of hair loss again. This patient has left this until quite long. It's another patient who presenting with a CCCA, which was confirmed on histology. This is a scarring type of hair loss. Dr. Chiam and myself spoke about it. We can treat some of this. Uh, we can do also hair transplants after a certain period of medical treatment. This is another condition. This is a patient with a condition called frontal fibrosing alopecia that we spoke about, where they lose hair on the hairline. And you can see the patient has got very tight extensions. And the more they continue to do this, the more the progression of the hair loss becomes. And this is quite difficult. Once you see the shiny scalp, it's actually very difficult to treat. And this patient on the right, again, it's a patient who has CCCA. You can see the inflammation and uh, the progression of the hair loss. And this patient used to relax the hair a lot and had braids, so it rapidly progressed. This is a, now look, look at this one. This is not traction alopecia. This is not in Jibaba. It's that condition I mentioned called FFFA, frontal fibrosing alopecia. We don't know what causes it, but a number of things have been implicated like using synthetic hair extensions, and sometimes some chemicals uh, that are used as part of some things, but we're still investigating this condition. We don't know what actually causes it. Mm -hmm. Not lost, we are able to sometimes help our patient. This is a patient of mine that I've seen who has uh, responded very well to medical treatment and some injections uh, after six months of treatment. And of course, another patient who's doing extremely well as well on medical treatment. Uh, this is a patient with CCCA who's responded extremely well on topical treatment, keeping the hair natural, no pulling, no, no skinning, no chemicals on the hair. And you can see that on the right-hand side, we are able to improve the condition. Again, I just wanted to touch on weaves and weaves that wrap there. The lace can cause problems. This is a young girl who's been using weaves since she's been 14 years old. And this is what happens at the back of the hair and on the front of the hair. So these are some of the uh, slides I wanted to share with you. Uh, Dr. Chiama is done. Oh, I thought I'd included the hair transplant one, but it's okay. Thanks, uh, Dr. Nyati. All right, thanks, 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 Prof. Um, there's also another question here. Um, how long should one have a hairstyle on their hair for? Long braids and straight up, that's one. Um, if I unbraided my hair on the 31st of October, how long should I wait before rebraiding the hair? So these uh, questions, I think, are linked. Uh, how long should you have the, the style and the break between, uh, you know, the previous style and, and coming up with a new style? Both of those styles being styles that have to do with uh, braiding the hair. I mean, I think the important thing to, to, to talk about is is what was the condition of your hair before you went into the style? And also how was the style put in? Those are two things that we tend not to think about. If your hair is not being taken care of properly as far as like washing, conditioning, moisturizing and trimming the hair on a regular basis, um, and your hair is not healthy before you put the braids in, um, you're gonna have a problem while the style is putting, being put in and after it's put in. Um, depending on the type of extension hair that is used, extension hair um, can be quite coarse and damaging to your regular hair. Not in terms of, not only in terms of the insulation where you can get traction alopecia where people tend to braid the hair tightly, but the hair itself can actually shear your own natural hair. And oftentimes patients who come out of braid styles will feel like the hair is a little bit more broken, a little bit more fragile. Um, especially given all of the underlying issues that we as women of African descent already have, the CCCA and all these other things, which can also lead to hair fragility, you have to be really careful about braiding. Now, yeah. with respect, so, so always keep those things in mind. 
Don't let somebody braid your hair too tight. If you're getting your hair braided and you feel any tension or pressure, you really need to speak up and be very vocal because in the long run, that tension and pain is a sign that your scalp, something is going on in your scalp. You know, when you hurt yourself or you scratch yourself, you feel pain. It's a signal of damage, impending damage or current damage in a tissue area. So on the scalp, if it hurts, it means that those hair follicles are being suffocated, they're being damaged. And over time, that can lead to inflammation and scar being laid down where the hair does not grow back. You want to give your hair a good breather. You have to ask yourself, why do you have to jump back into these braid styles, right? If it's for aesthetic purposes or, or if it's for work, I think it's important for us to really have a sense of how to do our own natural hair. You can even see from these pictures that Dr. Um, Flova showed us how well the person did by just leaving her hair alone. If she was getting medication and also put back in these tension type hairstyles, there's no way that her before and after would have done that. And I can also show you countless pictures where patients who just left their hair alone did a lot better. So the key question is, what can we do in order to learn and how to manage our own hair so that we don't have to continue to create injury by constantly um, putting styles in it that it was not necessarily meant to, to, to be in? I would wait a minimum of four weeks, minimum of four weeks, and be very careful about how the style is reintroduced back into the hair, making sure that that hair is properly prepped, you know, cleansed, trimmed, moisturized, and 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 all those other things. Another related question, Dr. Uh, you know, I'll say to to, um, with relation to young ones, when should a parent start to braid their daughter's hair? So I I think um, you know when you're dealing with. Um, children's hair, it's probably better just to do a simple two strand twist style. I would try to avoid doing things that add extensions um, to the hair, particularly that hairline is very, very, very fragile and sensitive in all of us. You know that we have obviously have skin hair and hair here. So the hair, that transition zone tends to be very, um, the hair tends to be more fragile and what we call more vellus and are definitely more prone to, to damage. You know, we're constantly washing our hair, making the hair more prone to, to breakage and things like that. So yeah. in children, you either leave it out or too strong to fit. Try not to do anything that creates damage because you really are setting up that child for problems in the future. I can't tell you how many of my patients say, oh, I remember I had a style when I was five, six, eight years old and, um, you know, I lost hair. And ever since then, it's been really hard for me to grow hair in that area. So let's not set our children up for problems in the future by really creating um, lessons for them where they don't um, put a lot of damage on their hair. So two strand twist styles are very gentle. And I think that that's the way to go. All right. Yeah, if I can, if I can just jump in there, uh, the, I fully concur with uh, Dr. Chiama. I mean, if I had a young daughter now, I'll keep my daughter said, just like the length of Dr. Chiyama's hair until they are 21. And I will be actually assured that at that age, they will have no traction. And it, it's very, it's very, very important because now we see traction alopecia at a very, very young age. There's a school year in uh, Namlazi in Devon. We're actually conducting a study there looking at the prevalence of hair, of traction alopecia in gyps between that uh, school at that high school, children, the girls are not allowed to do anything on their hair until they finish grade 12 from grade eight. And another school, a private school in Devon, just looking at girls who are like doing grade eight, already there's traction alopecia. So the evidence is there and, and traction alopecia, which is in Zimbabwe, is something that is preventable and we shouldn't really be seeing. So I really want to emphasize uh, what Dr. Achiamo Setutu has, has just mentioned. And sometimes, when you see casts on the hair, we call them hair casts, they look like dandruff, white strands just at the base of the hair. That's a sign that your hair has been pulled. And if I can share with you, I have got long hair, but most of the time, I, you know, I just do O1 or, I, or twist or uh, I do a, a, a Snoopy, but I don't feel any pain. I can sleep with my hair, I can wash, I wash my hair once a week as it is uh, braided. And I use the products and I can still keep that hair style. There's also another study that was conducted by L'Oreal showing that women who use uh, extensions, as Dr. Chiama mentioned, that the actual synthetic hair and fiber causes uh, pressure and then breakage on the natural hair shaft itself. And the study showed that 
women who, who actually use extensions on their hair, they damage the hair shaft and it breaks. And the recommendations was that you should only do that at least maybe two times or three times a year, not more than that. So if you want to put extensions, that should be twice or three times a year, not more than that. And at, at each time, it shouldn't be more than a month. Thanks. And I would ask like, just a personal um, note. I cannot use braid hair. You know, as I've gotten old, I can't. It, at the minute I take the extension hair out, my hair is shredded. So I cannot, even me myself as an African woman, right? Like we are, the, you know, the creators of great extension styles and it damages my hair so much that I can't use it. I've used it in the past. And, you know, before I became a dermatologist would sort of ignore some of the signs, which I think is common because we like the style. It's easy. Um, but it does definitely create problems with my hair. So you just have to be really careful. Um, I will often use a little bit of a risk reduction method because whenever we're talking about women and hairstyling, one has to be very careful about not giving them very many options, right? Because we all have very busy lives. And, you know, sometimes putting braids in is a lot easier as far as, you know, just us shuffling throughout our lives. So if you are going to do a braid style, I might recommend using human hair braids, human hair um, that's a little bit softer than the synthetic hair and still definitely waiting some time and taking care of your own hair before you do it. Making sure that when the person braids your hair that, that you do not feel any level of pain and you are walking them through every braid that they put in. If you feel any level of pain, you are asking them to please respectfully stop and redo that braid so that you feel less tension. When you have the hair in, try not to put your hair up in tight ponytails or put them back. You can put them back in a loose loose bun, but try not to put them too high up on the scalp because that will definitely tend to rip out the front of your hair. Thank you. Um, whilst, uh, yeah, whilst you're still on the floor, uh, Dr. Osei Tutu, the pictures I saw of you um, before <laughs> this session, you had... Uh, some ginger type of hair. So the question I have is, um, you know, would I call it tinting of hair or peroxide on the hair? Um, any dangers relating to that? That's a very good question. I am somebody who tends to have many hairstyles. <laughs> yeah, like many women. <laughs> and um, I have been artificially blonde on many occasions. And, um, the fact of the matter is dye damages the hair, right? Uh, my hair, thank God, is you know quite healthy because I take very good care of it. But dye breaks down your hair shaft. And so if you come into hair dyeing um, with your hair that, that's damaged and you don't take meticulous care of it afterwards, your hair is going to fall out because already the act of dyeing the hair breaks down the hair shaft. If you have an inflammatory scalp condition, like lichen planopilaris, the dye can create inflammation on the scalp that can, in some instances, exacerbate your particular hair loss condition. I also find in men who dye their hair for long periods of time that it may actually you know, unearth or exacerbate um, these um, inflammatory scalp conditions. There is a color within dark dye, black dye. Um, it's a type of benzene that um, some people are finding is um, maybe linked. There, there hasn't been a, an exact causal association, but it has been linked to um, breast cancer um, in women. And so you have to be very careful with dye because it can cause problems. Okay. All right. I think let's now switch and focus on the the range of products called Nuele Pro, all right? Um, right, so I understand that uh, Prof. Lover, uh, I'm gonna ask you a question. I understand that uh, as part of your PhD, uh, you know, research, uh, you did a lot uh, on ethnic hair uh, and some of the information that came from that has been, you know, um, used in the development of this product that you and Dr. Osei Tutu have collaborated in coming up with. So um, just to show people, you know, these, um, you know, these products, this Nuele Pro, 
it, you know, it comes in very, very beautiful uh, packaging. Uh, and uh, I think Mana needs to talk to us about this because it's visually attractive. And I'm looking at also the, uh, the brand, the, the brand name, Nuele Pro, N-W-E, and then two strands of hair, E Pro. So just there's a lot, just even before you talk about the product, this says, hmm, you should try me. So uh, I want uh, to understand the thinking behind this. But Dr. Dova, there is something that, uh, 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 you know, many people are starting to talk about. Uh, and this reminds me of a comment by our former president, Mbeki, who was saying in, in, in Africa, we tend to have people who are doing PhD studies and they come up, you know, with uh, obviously good stuff. It ends up in the libraries and everywhere else. But his view was we need to take those and actually translate it into stuff that can be used to solve the problems. So I want to know how much of what you came up with in your study um, for your PhD that actually uh, contributed to this Nuele Pro product, obviously uh, with also scientific insights coming from Dr. Osei Tutu. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Dr. Nyati. It was really a teamwork as we yes. have that uh, we, 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 we worked for about five years with uh, Dr. Osei Tutu working on the product. But again, I realized that, you know, you know, your science and research has to lead to innovation. I remember when I was working in PE in Livingston as, a, as an intern, there's a doctor they called Dr. Proctor. And Proctor was a surgeon. And he came up with a tube called the Proctor Livingston tube. And this is that was used for patients with the CA of the esophagus, a cancer of the throat, and it was obstructing the throat so that they can't eat anything. So he designed this tube that could actually go through the throat so that these patients can eat, although they have advanced cancer. So to me, I, I, it really, uh, that experience planted a seed. And again, you know, when I was in Singapore on a scholarship there, I saw a number of dermatologists would come up with new research and they'd always translate into something. So I felt that I've known, so I've done so much on hair, I understand so much the physiology and the experience and the clinical aspect of it, we have to come up with something as, as well as we understand our hair better and why not come up with a product that we can actually formulate from, from start and actually literally direct how it should be formulated. So that's how the whole thing uh, was born. And again, uh, although uh, Dr. Osei Tutu was, you know, trans transatlantic also thinking about similar uh, ideas. So that actually, uh, complemented and we merged our ideas. And of course, these things, again, I love working with other researchers in different disciplines. So I worked with a chemist here, I worked with a mechanical engineer, my mana. So all of these expertise brought in uh, uh, this, uh, this product to, to fruition. All right. Um, I just want to show people the different, uh, there's about four different uh, products within this range. And I want Dr. Osei Tutu and also maybe Mana uh, to tell us a little bit about each one of these. All right. Um, so there is what they call step one softening shampoo. All right. I don't know if you can see it, but anyway, this is a shampoo. Uh, they call it a soft softening shampoo, step one. I want to know what is the importance of having a shampoo to shampoo your hair and how often should you do that all right so uh, that's the first thing uh, i want to to hear about uh, you know from any of the, the team members uh, there's three of them here there's mana there's the dr say to do and there's uh, dr dover there's the second one uh, it's called detangling conditioner all right uh, detangling conditioner um, okay, again, um, it's part of the range. So that's the second product in the range. Then there is a third product in the range, um, the moisturizer. So I want to know 
conditioning. What, what do you, when you say you are conditioning hair, what exactly are you doing? And if you don't, what dangers, you know, or risks come with that? And then the moisturizer. Um, you know, Mana did talk about uh, moisturizers and the, some of the chemicals that should not be in the moisturizer. So that's the third product. And then the last one is something called Hair Fresh, all right? Uh, hair Fresh. So something that you spray to, re to freshen up your hair and make sure that this, the hair smells nice, especially if you've been in a place where there's been people who are smoking uh, and all of that. So Dr. Clover, you've got this, you know, your range uh, that you and Dr. Say Tutu have come up with, assisted by MANA to, 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 to produce three stages of hair care. And uh, as a person who is not very knowledgeable on how to care for hair, why these three steps? Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Nyati. I'll also allow Dr. Osei Tutu and our manufacturer to comment. So, yes. you know, what I, I we found in our discussions again with Dr. Osei Tutu when we're formulating and starting with these products was that we found that most Africans don't use conditioners, you know. It's almost like sometimes wash, they wash their hair and that's it. So the three steps are almost similar to the three steps that you use, you know, when you're looking after your face, you wash your hair, you then use a moisturizer and a sunscreen. So this is something similar. And then the, the shampoo itself, as you saw, it's got a pH of five, which means that it's less drying. It tends to maintain the skin barrier of the hair. Yeah. Second, most shampoos are very foamy, you know, very foamy. And that foaminess is a surfactant that actually dries the hair and the scalp. And now understanding the basic physiology of hair and the scalp, particularly for Africans, which you've asked me as the first question, we had to come up with a shampoo that's not too drying for the hair, because if it's too drying, particularly for African hair, it's going to be a problem. So that's the first step, the shampoo. And again, in terms of washing the hair, once a week is adequate, you can wash your hair once a week. And there's also a study that we've been conducting, looking at dandruff and accumulation of dandruff. I've worked with L'Oreal on this study to see how much and how frequently the microbiomes, the, the, the dendrite accumulates on the scalp. And we'll be publishing that soon to show that an average a week is recommended washing your hair once a week should be fine to remove the grease, the oil, and the sebum and all the dead cells that you have. But of course, if, if, we, if you are someone who is exercising, going to gym every day and sweating, you may need to wash your hair quite frequently. Uh, Dr. Sotito will tell you that some of our patients, actually I had a patient, I think last week, who had not washed the hair for three months, for literally three months. And the scalp was inflamed, there was dandruff, it was red, it was really challenging. So I'll let uh, Dr. Osei to, to talk about the second step, which is the conditioner. All right, over to you, Dr. Osei Tutu. Yeah, so um, shampoos tend to cleanse the scalp very well, but most of the ingredients in shampoos um, don't add a lot of moisturizing ingredients in it to add a sort of um, suppleness so that um, the, the, hair, the hair fibers can move about each other with relative ease. Um, also shampoos, a lot of um, the ingredients, obviously we're gonna be washing off. The conditioning step is for us, it's time for us to add things to the hair that are going to soften it and uh, reduce the amount of friction um, on the hair and also add softening ingredients. Um, and also help to neutralize the, the, the pH that sometimes the, the shampoo um, might throw off a little bit. Um, we also in the shampoo, and I'll let um, Nana add to this, add various um, uh, oil oils in there, particularly jojoba oil. And jojoba oil is important because it does have a similar oil um, components that we have in our natural sebum that tends to coat, coat the hair. Um, so that's what conditioning is for. And you must condition after you shampoo because the, the two usually will pair together. All right. Okay. So uh, Mana, uh, do you want to come in? Uh, just tell us more. Uh, I know we haven't gotten to the third stage of moisturizing uh, or step of moisturizing, but just uh, any comments around these two stages? You are producing many other products out the personal care products. And uh, so uh, you have an opportunity or you had an opportunity of, of comparing and contrasting 
uh, and uh, taking the input from the two dermatologists uh, in the you know and information from the uh, chemist who did the formulation, uh, Wayne, who unfortunately is not here today. So just uh, tell us a little bit around these two steps. I think if I can maybe maybe put it in, into context, because we also manufacture products for, if I would call it fast moving consumer goods, um, mm -hmm. and the likes of, you heard the words L'Oreal, Unilever, a lot of those products that are sold within those channels Cost is an exceptionally strong factor to try and reduce cost. Yeah. Um, and in making this shampoo, uh, I've noticed, and because I'm not, I wouldn't call myself a formulator, I might have made small adjustments to make it work effectively on a manufacturing level. But the ingredients, the, it's exceptionally good ingredients that they put into the products. Um, so, and, and that's what I noticed right, right from the beginning. The kind of quality... Uh, that was put into formulating the products were, were significant. Um, and there's a significant difference to what you would find out in the retail trade. Uh, and and, and that's what makes, for me, what makes it completely unique. When we make it in the plant, its ingredients are stored in a special area, specially temperature controlled. Um, and, and it's of such high quality. And hence, the final product uh, on the shampoo and conditioner side uh, it really does the job. It's not just about saying saying what it does. It actually does do it. Mm. And, and it's gentle to both the hair and the scalp? Absolutely. The, 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 the products, uh, as I said, it's, the surfactants are completely natural. There's lots of oils, uh, moist, soft moisturizing things in there that softens the hair, that protects the hair. You know, you can go into a lot of scientific detail, but I think for the average man on the street, it gets quite complex. I yeah. think the two, the two uh, researchers and doctors will, will attest to that. Um, and because I make it, I see it, uh, I can only attest to that and, and the test that we have done in, in the laboratory. Beautiful. Uh, you know, when we were preparing for this um, show with uh, Prof. Lova, we had a five, five, ten minute chat. You know, she said... Um, in the formulation uh, and looking at the ingredients, um, they spared nothing to make sure that these products are high quality. And she used an example that, you know, when you go to the shop, spa or uh, pick and pay or whatever, you can buy different types of orange juice. Another one will be 30% orange juice, you know, uh, of orange. 60%, another 100%. So for them, uh, you know, working with you guys, you know, uh, understanding uh, the needs of this ethnic hair, they went for the highest, you know, concentrations uh, that are, you know, are, are not, you know, going to cause any damage to, to people's hair uh, so that there can be the softening of the hair. Uh, you know, and I understand. I mean, one of uh, one, my niece has used the products already, and uh, she's been using imported products uh, from um, you know one of the Caribbean uh, islands. And she now told her mom, "You know what? From now onwards, I only want these Nuele Pro products and nothing else." So, so uh, you know, that's coming from a, a, a sixteen-year-old uh, who wants nothing else to make sure that her natural hair is actually healthy. All right, so let's go to the third step, which is the moisturizer. Um, the third step, uh, the moisturizer, um, there's a lot of oils here, that uh, jojoba oil, argan oil, shea butter, coconut oil. Um, yeah, so this step, how important is it and how often? should one be moisturizing? Is it a daily thing? Is it a weekly thing? You know, um, yeah. 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 So, so, so oh, I'll, yeah. I'll, go right I'll here. And then you can, um, so as we said, one of the big issues with um, curly, coily hair is the lack of the um, oil producing glands and the oil are natural oils to coat the hair. Um, and so we have to find ways to recreate that. 
um, you know, our hair is the most uh, malleable and movable when it's wet, right? And so we know in the shower, the hair feels really soft. If yeah. you look at the, the moisturizer, the first ingredient is water. So we really want to hit that hair shaft with, with water. And then we want to add oils that are formulated in a way that's not going to be too heavy, right? If you use um, sort of fresh oils um, from the bottle and you use too much of them, it can become very difficult to re-moisturize the hair, particularly if you're not washing it on a regular basis because those oils can tend to get built up. So the way that we formulated it um, is in a light and creamy way that tends to create moisture on the hair. And that moisture means that the hairs are able to move um, next to each other without breaking, right? It minimizes the breakage. It minimizes the friction between the hairs um, to keep those hairs more malleable and pliable. So you can do it as many times as you want to. It really depends on your styling needs. So if you're somebody who tends to wash your hair once a week, which is usually recommended, and you, let's say, wear your hair in a twist style, um, you can use it once a week um, or twice a week when you want to refresh in. If you hair, wear your hair short like mine, you can use it every day if you need to. So it just depends on your hairstyling needs. All right. Uh, Prof. Dover, do you want to add anything before I ask Mana? Yes, yes, Dr. Kenyatta. I fully concur with Dr. Osei Tutu. Uh, also, the other thing that we, we, we try to do, you know, there's a condition called pomade acne. Pomade acne, you'll remember when people were having perms and curls, you'd get acne, you know, on your forehead. So with this product, particularly the, the leave-on conditioner, we made sure that we don't put a lot of oils because that can clog the pores, pores and also cause a, um, a, a thingy acne on your forehead. And sometimes, you know, you're sitting in a, on your bed or you're sleeping and your whole pillow is full of oil and your, your bed rest is full of oil. So those are some of the things we're actually explicit in terms of, so you don't want something too greasy. You don't want anything that's going to cause problem and clog pores and make the hair too heavy. And also after applying the moisturizer, we didn't want something that's gonna leave the hair white and it takes time to disappear because we've experienced all of that. Unfortunately, our formulating chemist and manufacturer were able to abide by those uh, requirements. Beautiful. All right, Mana, um, about the moisturizers? Yeah, I can't really say much more than what, what uh, Prof and Doctor said. I think the only comment is if you, and the comment you made, you can see some of the good quality oils going in there. Um, it's not too heavy. It's just perfectly formulated just for, just for the particular application. Yes. But okay, while staying with you, Mana, the branding, Beautiful branding, you know, uh, and Nuele, Nuele is more like Nguni for her, but also in terms of the Swahili, uh, is also, you know, a Swahili name, you know. Um, so that tells me that uh, there's something to do with the African continent, yeah. Whether it is because you want uh, these products to be accepted in the continent, uh, or you want to locate them, you know, that they are from this continent. Uh, so, yeah, wh wh what was the thinking that went behind this, um, you know, the branding? Sam, I have to save Mana there because... <laughs> I was just about to pass it on to you there. <laughs> he, was, he was merely a manufacturer. He had nothing to do with the branding, but... Uh, okay. <laughs> I have to credit, I have to credit my husband, uh, Dr. Mabaso, who yeah. came with the Nwele name as, uh, because it's a, it's a Zulu, uh, Kosa, Swazi, and Swahili name. And even the graphic design, you know, those hair follicles there, it was his own uh, creation. So credit goes to, to him for the actual branding, but the packaging and everything was uh, more of my idea. And of course, uh, Dr. Achiyama's uh, approval. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. And then the last in the range, the last in the range uh, is this hair fresh. You know, uh, I'm trying to see if I can get closer, right? Hair fresh, right? So there's been a moisturizer, there's been a conditioner, there's been a moisturizer, you know, um, a shampoo, a conditioner, and a moisturizer. Now there is this called fresh. Hair fresh. What is the thinking here? 
Yeah, I'll, I'll also allow Akiyama to say the hair fresh basically it's a, it's actually something special, a cherry on top for our range because we felt that, as I mentioned, most uh, um, uh, people wash their hair once a week. So again, that's also protective. So we felt that to have a hair fresh, almost like a perfume that you spray on your neck when you just go out, it will, you know, give that nice fragrance and freshness to your hair. And you spray it just, you know, just like you do 10 centimeters from your hair. And again, it can also be used by men, you know, for your beard. My patients love it uh, because, you know, when your girlfriend, your wife comes closer to you, you just spray it. Yeah. (laughs) 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 <laughs> a, a little closer yeah so it's for men for the those who have beards specifically and then of course the for for your hair to give it that fresh uh, aroma to your to your to your to your hair and sometimes you go to parties and uh, or next to a bride and there's that smoky aroma to your hair so maybe you don't have time to wash your hair the following day you just spray it over your hair okay all right um doctor or say juju We've now seen the whole range um, from the shampoo, the conditioner, the moisturizer, and the cherry on top, uh, the hair fresh. Yeah. So um, in the US, are you already, you know, uh, making the product available to your clients? So we are working very vigorously on getting it in the U.S. Um, and we have made some really great strides in the last um, month or so. So hopefully within the next um, you know, couple of months, we should have it um, available to, for sale, number one, in my office, and then for sale um, more largely in the U.S. as a well. whole. So very soon. All right. Now, there's a question that has come up from Advocate Taleka, um, our Deputy Public Protector. Um, she is asking, who is the target market of these products? Um, you know, are these exclusively for people of, um, you know, with, with African descent? Um, or can they be used by everyone? Uh, and remember here, Mana did tell us that uh, his wife actually did use the products, um, you know, and uh, she was quite impressed, you know, with the quality of the product. So my understanding just from that is that this is universal, but certainly addressing some of the challenges that are normally found with other products in relation to ethnic hair. But uh, please, uh, you guys can answer that question. Oh, I can, I can take that, uh, Dr. Nyat. It's a good question. I just want to share an anecdote that when we're doing a pilot study, because we scientists, so we try and uh, make sure that we try this and get a survey. And uh, we looked at about 20 dermatologists, uh, 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 five of them African, Indian, Asian, and, 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 and colored and white. And we got feedback from the survey that although the products were actually meant for afro texture, they turned out that even the other uh, ethnic groups love the products. So it's actually meant for all ethnic groups. However, the moisturizer, remember we mentioned in the basic sciences that African hair is much more dry compared to European or Asian hair. So the moisturizer is not so much for the European or Asian hair. However, it can be used once a week on the split ends for that group. But for the Africans, it's something that you can use twice or three times or once a week, as Dr. Achiyama said. So in a nutshell, the products are targeted at all types of hair, but the third, uh, the third step, which is the conditioner, should be used less vigorously for those with Eurasian hair. And the nice thing about this range, also we have an educational pamphlet within the package, which, which teaches you about the different types of hair and how to look after your hair and, and, and what are some of the challenges. Uh, it's, it comes with a package, it's an educational pamphlet, which is. Uh, based on on, on our published data. So that's the target in terms of the groups. In terms of the market, it's more a middle class, upper class uh, uh, target market because it's a little costly because of the ingredients that we've used and the cost of those ingredients. So that's the market that we are targeting. All right. Now we do have a special going on. Yeah. Now um, there is a friend of mine 
uh, who is a marketing guru, uh, Ms. Zipporah Maubane, uh, who, uh, you know, uh, yesterday when he saw that we're going to have this, uh, when she saw that we're going to have this session, um, I encourage her to be part of it because she had some question or questions uh, that she wanted to pose. So, uh, Zipporah, I've enabled you to ask the question uh, to the dermatologist. Uh, please, um, I know you did not send through a question, but uh, she is one of those people who rocks a very long uh, natural hair. <laughs> uh, please switch on that camera, Zipporah. What is it? <laughs> You know this um, um, microphone. Please, please, we want to see you there. Okay. 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 I'll, I'll be I'll be coming through in a minute. Okay. All right. Um. But anyway, so um, there was a question by Dr. Bunolo who said, "Are these products?" for people with alopecia or can they be used by anybody to look after hair? So I think we did not specifically answer that question. Yeah, they yeah. Can for, for, yeah. For, for Zipporah. Yeah, they can certainly be used by anybody for any condition. Um, you know, we specifically um, kept in mind all of the harmful ingredients that tend to go in products as we talked about with that Harvard environmental study. Um, and so yeah, anybody can use it. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. All right, um, Zipporah, uh, can you come to now? I think, um, yes, Doc. I think you need to um, enable me on the, the camera. You you've unmuted the, vo the the speaker only. Okay, let me see. Uh, I want them to see your long hair. So. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, what's happening now? Why am I not getting what I'm looking for? Uh, okay, I don't know what's happening. Uh, anyway, please ask your question. Uh, if I manage to get this thing sorted, then I will uh, uh, enable that. But you can ask your question in the meantime. Uh, all righty. So um, I thank you very much. Um, to Professor and Doctor and the gentleman that was uh, talking earlier, I think I missed a lot of what he had to say. Um, I am very excited to know about the product. Uh, I've always been curious about what's the best way. Yeah, you, you can do your camera now. <laughs> Is it all right? Oh, okay. I don't know what happened now. Zipora, she has just disappeared on us. I don't know what happened there. I'm here. I'm here. Okay, please ask your question here. Yeah. All right. Okay. So yeah. my question is, so thank you very much for the opportunity to talk here uh, amongst uh, the, <clears throat> the greatest uh, entrepreneurs, academics, and this is so exciting. I've always been curious about how to, you know, what are the actual scientific steps required to look after black hair? I'll just call it black hair, right? So right now, uh, I'm, I'm not wearing my own hair. It's, uh, it, well, I bought it, but it's actually a, <laughs> a weave, you know? So um, my question is around Afro hair discrimination. And I wondered if Dr. Dudu and uh, Professor Glover, Glover have experienced it before. So I've, for the past 10 years or so, I've been just wearing different weaves and all that. And I think, you know, there's as much as we know that as black women, we are creative, we braid, we wear weaves and all that. But I think there's something at, uh, that, that talks to elements of, you know, perceptions around our own hair not being appropriate, not being tidy, not being professional enough and all that. And uh, so, so as a result, when, you know, you find yourself just wearing this long hair all the time. So when I'm reading about Afro, Afro hair discrimination at the moment, and I'm wondering if you've experienced any of that, uh, Dr. Tutu and 
uh, Professor Clover, you know, the reasons why people don't wear their own hair because at school or the workplace, you know, our own natural hair is seen as not being appropriate. Yeah. Well, we didn't really get into this because I think it is a, an, a whole discussion point on its own. You know, all of the psychosocial issues that are involved in the reasons why um, Black women, when women of African descent end up having some of the problems that they do have with their hair. It's not simply sometimes because you want to do it. It's because based on social pressures, you feel like you have to do it. Um, and across the diaspora, um, you know, if there is a Eurocentric ideal of beauty, and I would, I would dare to say that it's across the whole world because even in Ghana, you know, we feel the pressure. Um, you know, you do feel like you have to wear your hair in a certain way in order to be quote unquote presentable because that is the messaging that you have, that we've had. And even in the United States, there is something called the Crown Act that a group of legislators and stylists, you know, they've come together and they've gone across to each state where you cannot discriminate um, black women um, or black yes. people based on the types of hairstyles that they have. So it is quite sad commentary that we have to legislate wearing our hair the way it naturally grows from our head. So that kind of just tells you the kind of pressure that we are facing across the diaspora. Um, I would say specifically in, in my situation, you know, I've been in pri private practice the whole time. And if you've looked at me throughout the years, I've had every single hairstyle, you know, from relaxers to jerry curls. I don't, I don't like to admit it, but <laughs> you know, to weaves, to braids. Yes, happy, yeah. exactly. <laughs> um, and I've worn my hair quite confidently at every stage. If somebody has had something to say, they dare not say it to me. I would say that I've never, <laughs> I've never experienced it. Um, and I constantly change my hair. Um, and one of the things that is really important to me, particularly within my practice, is making sure that I wear my hair natural as much as possible and also change it, cut it differently, grow it so that people, and make sure that it's also really healthy so that people can see, um, you know, how important it is and how you know professional that you can still look with your hair natural and it is yeah, a mm -hmm. big part of the discussions that i have on a daily basis if you heard what i said before about doing hair transplantation in women of african descent one of the big topics is how are you going to wear your hair afterwards it's even a more complicated discussion than the actual surgery itself right because a lot of times some of the styles that they get themselves back into might create a lot of tension and, and stress. So hair discrimination and the reasons why black women wear their hair in certain ways is an extremely important topic. And we can have a whole nother discussion on that itself. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, that's that's absolutely true. I, I know now in the UK they there's actually efforts that are being made by some activists to actually get Af natural African hair to be protected as a unique characteristic in the Equality Act of, of, of the British government. So it's it's very important, but I'm, I'm pleased that uh, your hair products are going to help us as black uh, women in particular to look after our natural hair so that we can wear it if when we want to and wear other hair types when we want to or braid when we want to. I think the, the great thing is around being able to, to have the right care for the hair. Yeah. All right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Zipporah. Uh, thank you for your contribution. Um, right. There's just another question here. Um, we are taught that the types of alopecia mentioned as CCCA, LPP, etc., is scarring. That is, the hair loss is permanent. Are there any studies or information that prove that it's possible for the hair to come back? If so, how long would it take? It gets very sad when it doesn't come back after a long time. This is from Mobile Kumede. Mm, maybe I can tackle that one and uh, Dr. Chiama can also add. As we mentioned earlier on, scarring, alopecia, sacrificial meaning it's irreversible. But again, that's not cast in stone. It depends at what stage of the alopecia is and how much uh, uh, hair loss has been lost. And Dr. Chiama will agree with me that in my experience, I found that if you still have a bit of fine hair on the base, 
one would still be able to get the hair back. I have had great successes in terms of treating patients with these conditions, but uh, my chances of, su- of success are higher if the patient presents early. And also my chances of success are higher if the patient ensures that there's no further damage or pulling or chemical damage uh, to the hair. And as well as if I use combination treatment, both medical treatment, which could be systemic medication, topical, as well as injections like platelet-rich plasma and needling. And uh, in fact, we should be publishing a few cases pretty soon on some of the positive results I have of, of, on these patients. And it takes, uh, depending on the extent, I show you some cases where there's shiny hair and it's a great area. Uh, chances of success there are, are really minimal, but it can take up to a year or two years, you know, for your hair to, to, to come back on, on just medical treatment. But of course, on, in transplant, the, the process can be shorter in terms of six months up to a year, but Dr. Sosei you can dwell on that. But again, there are certain indications for hair transplant and there are certain patients that you cannot do hair transplants on. And uh, maybe you may want to uh, make a uh, comment, uh, Dr. Chiama. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. Um, that's why we're so adamant about people coming as early as possible. Um, in inflammatory alopecia, the, one of the problems is that the, the inflammation recruits scar cells. And those scar cells are laid down around the hair follicle. And once it does that, it destroys the follicle permanently. You cannot get um, uh, a scarred follicle back. And so as Dr. Deluga said, you if, if there is inflammation around the follicle, which causes the follicle not to really produce a great hair for the hair to grow thin, um, you can save the follicle at that point, but not after it's scarred down. Um, so get in as early as possible. Okay. All right, thank you. We, we now have just about eight minutes before we wrap up the discussion. We took a little longer because uh, we lost about 15 minutes at, at the beginning. So apologies uh, for that, but uh, we have to finish in about eight minutes. Right, so um, Dr. I'll say to do, you're doing a lot of hair transplants uh, in your clinic uh, in Brooklyn, uh, New York City. And you now are going to be collaborating, I am, that's my understanding, uh, or assisting um, the team of Dr. Dover to do the same here in South Africa. Just tell us a little bit about what's happening there. And, uh, you know, maybe Prof. Robert can tell us when that transplant, um, you know, service can uh, or is going to start. Yeah, um, I mean, that this is the reason why, um, you know, the Dr. Globa came five or six years ago to my office to really sort of start that process. And she's really done her due diligence um, uh, and really trained with, um, doctors far greater than, than myself across the world um, and been to a lot of lectures, some of which we have been to together um, to really learn how to do hair transplantation properly um, and to do hair transplantation specifically for people of African descent. I, as I understand in South Africa, there's not really anybody focusing on that. Um, and so it is really, really important, particularly given the um, amazing expertise that Dr. Delova has in diagnosing hair loss conditions and combining it with the, the, the surgical options. You know, not everybody who comes for transplant is a candidate for transplantation. So really understanding like who to say yes to and who to say no to is even more important than doing the surgery itself. So I'll, I'll let her answer as far as like when they're gonna be starting the program, but I think soon, yeah. yeah. Thank you, thank you, Prof. Lover. Yes, uh, thanks, Dr. Nyat. Yes, uh, we've uh, formed an association with uh, uh, two plastic surgeons that we'll be working with. They've also gone for training. We've got our machine. So we should be starting, get going uh, from next year, January. Okay, that's, that's just a few weeks from now. <laughs> yeah. We are very excited. We'll, we, we'll probably give you a free hair transplant with mana. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I started losing my hair at the age of 25. By the age of 30, you know, I tried minoxidil, topical minoxidil, and everything else, and uh, my hair just kept on going. So from the age of 30, I've been rocking this hairstyle. I gave up a long time ago. I'm getting too old for this stuff. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, but anyway, I think the house. <laughs> yeah, so all right. Um, closing remarks from you, uh, Mana. Uh, you know, in terms of just you know the, the assurance you give to the market out there uh, about the quality of these products, uh, and also maybe again the distribution channels. You know, where people can actually get these, uh, you know, products. Uh, you talked about an online, uh, you know, uh, channel. Uh, maybe you can just repeat that. Uh, maybe, maybe Prof can comment on that. I can just say that we, on, on this side, what we do is uh, our, our priority is making sure that the, the, the brand is always in stock. Um, and and we manufacture, we look after the whole supply chain, we make sure everything is there, all the raw materials and ingredients are sourced. Uh, and then Prof Lova, she, she and her team manages the whole social media, um, the campaigns, everything that happens around the website. So people can buy it off the website. Prof, you want to comment on the website and from your practice? Yeah, sure, sure. Maybe, yeah. So, Lova, maybe you can talk about uh, that. Um, you know, uh, people can get them. And if you are in Johannesburg, you want the products, where do you do, where do you go? If you are in Cape Town, um, but also I understand there's some Black Friday special of some kind. Yes, uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Nyat. Yeah, no, I mean, the mana is, you know, he's got the fingers on the pulse, the products are there, we won't run short of any. And uh, it's been really amazing. It's, I know one of my colleagues ordered the products from Joburg and Cape Town and they were, very happy with the swift delivery, which, is, which was within 24 hours and everything, the process of buying online was uh, easy. So basically you can get the products online, it's www.noele.co.za. You, uh, and uh, you can also get them from Joanna Speck, from Dr. Nyati. We have a select uh, number of uh, uh, doctors that we keep them, I think Dr. Mbofu as well. So uh, Dr. Nyati has just uh, uh, ordered his stock and, and he's received it. So you can contact him if you are in Johannesburg. If you are anywhere else, from, uh, you can get them online. Within 24 hours, you'll get your products. If you are in Devon, you can get them from my practices. And of course, we have a Black Friday 20% uh, discount, which is uh, ending the, on the 12th of December. And the code that you need to use, which I offered uh, Dr. Nyati for, for his uh, listeners is NW all caps up 20 Friday uh, upper caps. So NW, which is for Noelle, 20 and Friday upper caps. So if you put that code when you buy online, you'll get a 20% discount, meaning the trio, which is about 800 rands, you get it for about 600, uh, 620 or so. And this special is up to the 12th of December. Website is Noele Pro, uh, email is nuelepro.so.za. And the website is www.nuele.so.za. All right. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, any closing remarks from you, Dr. Akiyama? No, you did not talk about actually even uh, getting clients in Australia and other parts of the world that are actually oh. buying. Yes, yes, we have, uh, we have uh, exported quite a number of products to the UK, some dermatologists and trichologists there in Australia, in Amsterdam, as well as uh, in the USA. And of course, there's a great interest from Africa. A number of my African dermatologists want to keep the products in their, in their rooms. And of course, MANA is working very closely with us to ensure that we get these to the US as well as they may be available on uh, Amazon. And uh, Mana is assisting us with that regard. All right. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, all right, Mana. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to share as we wrap up? Uh, and I'll ask for the same uh, from you, Dr. Akiyama Oseidutu, um, and also uh, Prof. Nova, then you can uh, close it. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's quite, from, from a manufacturing perspective, generally people, when they buy the product, they don't see what happens in the background. They really see the product on shelf or uh, with their supplier. And uh, my comment is that people can really have peace of mind that this is really, it is a fantastic product. It's well manufactured, it's well supplied, well researched. And the people involved with it are a group of very, very good professionals. So I can endorse it from our side um, and uh, everybody else that's been using it. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. You know, um, I see, you know, uh, you, you, you are a businessman with a big heart, a lot of social responsibility programs. I see that you do a lot of pro bono work, uh, you know, advising up and coming entrepreneurs um, and uh, also mentoring others. So, uh, paying it forward, you know, so you're not just profit driven, uh, like, I mean, there's no guilt in being profit driven, that's why we're in business, but uh, you go further to actually make a difference to others. So thank you very much. Uh, may you continue to do the great work. Uh, all right, so Dr. Osei Tutu, um, your closing remarks. Um, I am extremely happy and proud to be working with this team and more specifically, um, the messaging that is coming around the product. You know, it is important um, to wash, moisturize, and condition your hair, but it's also really important for us to really understand our hair, how to treat our hair, and all of the underlying scalp conditions that we tend to see. Hair loss, particularly in women of African descent, here and across the globe is epidemic. Um, and it's important that we get the information and that we get the help. So the, the, the product line, I think is extremely important that we have you know, non-toxic ingredients that are super moisturizing to our hair, but also that we develop an understanding around some of the issues around black hair as well. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, Prof. Lova, uh, your closing remarks. Uh, I'm gonna take you up on that hair transplant situation, man. You know, <laughs> <laughs> four years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they won't recognize you on your platform. <laughs> and, and, and that's special for you and Mana only exclusively. <laughs> yeah, so th thanks, uh, Dr. Nyati, for creating the platform for us to share our expertise as well as uh, convey the messages and educate our consumers and our colleagues. I mean, you are doing a lot of CSI yourself. It's a Sunday, you're busy preparing all of this. So we appreciate that. And uh, as Dr. Achiama mentioned, hair loss, in fact, looking at the epidemiology of, hair, of skin condition, hair loss is in the top five conditions that you see in Africa and, uh, and amongst African-Americans. So it is a real challenge. And it's good that we are sharing this information. As you said, we don't want to keep these in journals or textbooks. We need yeah. to do that and get it out there to the consumers so they know what we're doing. Uh, in what happened there now, Snow? Instead of is you know because this information is from that we are is really something that we appreciate so that even if people tend uh, end up doing what they are not supposed to do at least they are making informed decisions they've been educated they've been empowered they know what is fact and they know what is myth and they can make that decision so that's what we are here for and in terms of the products again I'm grateful for you for embracing African entrepreneurs for embracing African uh, scientists and researchers, because again, we want to do, the, to do the research and, but then the research must actually catapulate into something that we're all proud of and make our own products in Africa for our African people. Thank you so much for the platform and thank you. For but you are based in Deben. Where are you in Deben and how do people, you know, get that consultation with you, um, you know, um, to, 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 to make sure that, uh, uh, when they are in Durban, or if they are in Durban, they can actually come for a consultation, you diagnose them, and then advise them appropriately. Uh, this is over and above the issue of the products uh, where people can go on the Nuele website. Sure. So we have a, a special hair clinic in Amsanga, and one can make an online booking, www.multimedics.co.za, or they can phone 031 566-1603. Our special hair clinic is in Amsanga, in Amsanga Rocks, opposite Kusamed Hospital. So they can call or go on to the website and make their booking and we see patients. Uh, uh, can you repeat that more? It's uh, www.multimedics.amsanga.co.za or the telephone number is 031 uh, 5661603. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me also say thank you to everybody who managed to join in. It's a Sunday. You know, it's a day when people are already worrying about the week ahead. Uh, you know, so for you to put just over 90 minutes of your time 
uh, to listen to you know uh, people talking uh, it's not uh, you know a small thing so thank you very much to everybody uh, we hope that in some way this conversation and the sharing of the product um, you know and any answers that were answered by the specialist uh, and, and also by mana who is the better uh, that will help you to make better choices when you go uh, and decide what to use to look after your hair going forward. Thank you very much. And we hope uh, you will stay safe. There is a new variant in South Africa and it's spreading in the rest of the world. So please look after yourselves. Um, yeah, uh, we, we are said that we will most likely get another, you know, um, festive season of lockdown. But uh, it's all in our hands. Let's go and vaccinate, and let's uh, you know, let's do all what we are advised to do in terms of non-pharmacological interventions. Mask up uh, and sanitize, and do all of those things. And please vaccinate. Only 85% of adult South Africans uh, have taken up the offer for vaccination, and 41% who've had at least one jab. That's not good enough. We should be at 70% by the end of December, and surely we're going to miss that target. And with this new variant, we don't know what it's going to do. So please, guys, do the right thing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nyaji. Thanks for that, too. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.